my name is Angad, uh, and uh, I'm the DevOps engineer at Wiki. Uh, so we are a pretty small team. Uh, can you guys hear me? No. No. Okay. Hello. Can you guys hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Speak louder. Speak louder. Okay. Uh, so I'm a, I'm a DevOps engineer at Wiki. We're a very small team. We're around two people. Uh, I don't know if I should call it a team, it's just two people. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about uh, a very popular logging stack called the ELK, which most of you guys might have heard about, and some of you might even be using it at, at various parts of your infrastructure. Uh, so first of all, uh, let me just introduce myself. Uh, uh, Wiki is a global video streaming site with subtitles. It's a crowdsource subtitle, so it, that's why it's called Wiki. W-I-K-I is crowdsource content, and V-I-K-I is crowdsource video subtitles. Uh, so uh, before this, uh, before joining Wiki around one year, one year ago, I was a uh, site reliability engineer at Twitter, and I graduated from National University of Singapore. Uh, so yeah, so let's let's uh, get into this. Uh, so ELK uh, is that animal, and uh, it's also the Elasticsearch log stash Kibana stack. I'll be going into some details about this. Uh, so before I actually start start about this, uh, I want to just uh, highlight one important point. Uh, Logging is not metrics. Metrics is a completely different ballgame. That's that's a completely different uh, uh, side of your uh, monit uh, different side of your monitoring. Uh, you, you you don't want to compare these two things. Like these are these are apples and oranges, right? Uh, treating an Elasticsearch log stash Kibana stack uh, for your alerting and monitoring will not give you like really optimal results. For that, there are already uh, great software written out there like Sensu. And if you want to pay a lot of money, New Relic, uh, and, and, and a bunch of other things, uh, which is already it's already a, a solved problem. Uh, so metrics are basically your numeric time series data. Uh, you want to generate your actionable alerts from those based on your uh, thresholds. Hey, my success rate is down from my SLA. That's a, that's an actionable alert. They are essentially accounts, uh, statistic, statistical averages, means, median, P ninety P ninety latency, P ninety nine latency. There are already a lot of, as I mentioned, scalable, cost-effective solutions. Uh, where logging comes comes in place is basically your debugging. So let's say you receive a pager duty alert that hey your success rate is down. Uh, the first thing that you should be doing uh, as a as a good DevOps engineer is not logging to the server, but actually look at the the logs that are coming in. Logging into the server, tailing the log file that 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 will actually take time rather than you just going to your uh, pre pre-configured dashboard in, in Elasticsearch uh, in Kibana. And just looking at the at the, at the logs, uh, it's also useful for uh, full text searching, which metrics does not give you. I mean, metrics is numbers. Logging is basically text searching. Uh, so let's say I'll give you an example of where full text searching is actually useful. So let's say you want to do. Uh, so at Wiki we have a large stack. Uh, it's around 30 microservices. A request flows in. It hits multiple parts of the infrastructure. It goes to Redis. It goes to uh, the database. It, so let's say you have access logs from all of these services. Uh, now, as as in when a request comes to these services, you as in when a request comes to the load balancer, you give it a unique ID, and that unique ID is propagated down to all the uh, all the microservices that it is hitting. And then you can search for that that unique ID to actually get the trace of where that request from the user went inside into into, into your entire system. Uh, so that's that's one example of uh, full text searching with, with, with that's useful. Uh, other examples could be like you want to search for but that you have a lot lot of uh, endpoints with the uh, API endpoints with a large number of uh, get parameters. Uh, you could be doing metrics on all of those, but that might just take a lot of effort for you. Uh, it might just be useful to throw them into the to, to Elasticsearch as a catch-all, and then you you can be able to you can be able to search through those uh, in in Kibana. Uh, there, there are also a bunch of other users. Uh, I'm not going to focus on, on, on a lot of users. My goal is to give you uh, an overview of how to build a cluster that, that can handle a large number of logs. Uh, so, and also, Elasticsearch is computationally intensive. It's harder to scale because just the, the sheer volume of logs as compared to, to metrics. So this is what I was talking about. So we use a service called SignalFX uh, that basically is uh, our, our store for uh, time series data of, of key value metrics. Uh, let's say it triggers an alert, success rate alert for service X, goes to period duty, an engineer looks at it, and then goes goes into the logs uh, uh, Kibana to look at the, to look at actually what's happening. 
uh, and go through the actual the actual requests. Uh, so these are the uh, logs that we currently track uh, every week. Uh, so <coughs> starting with application logs, these are, let's say you have a Golang application that through, through some exception you want to be able to catch all the exceptions and, and, and store it in some place instead of going in SSHing into your server. Uh, stack traces, handled ex even handled exceptions, you can just uh, log them so with different uh, severity levels. Uh, access logs are yours. So all our services uh, have been configured to log whatever request that they're receiving in a standard uh, JSON. Uh, which includes the status codes, you, the URI, uh, the HTTP method, uh, user agent, uh, IP address, remote IP address, f what IP address has the request been forwarded for, and also the unique uh, unique ID which is tagged by the load balancer at the, at the top level. Uh, we also have a uh, we also have a unique use case for uh, log stack uh, for for uh, this this stack. Uh, we also send some client event metric, uh, client event uh, events from uh, client side JavaScript and mobile applications. So this is also useful for debug, uh, debugging crashes unless you want to play, pay for an expensive service like Crashlytics or something. Uh, this is useful that you can actually have the entire stack traces being sent to you uh, and stored in your own Elasticsearch. Uh, we have already standardized all the log format to JSON, easy to add and remove fields. It's slightly verbose, it's, 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 it, there's a slight overhead, uh, but it's actually very flexible in terms of uh, 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 being able to add or remove any, any new fields. Uh, and as I mentioned, request tracing through various services using unique ID. Uh, then, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll go into the details of uh, like how we have our log stash, uh, so like what, what exactly is log stash Elasticsearch in Kibana. Uh, before, I, before I go into that, I'll, I'll give you an overview of what the current scale is. So our current uh, log volume is around 300 gigabytes per day, uh, which includes, uh, which is around 200 GB from, uh, uh, from the applications and the access logs, and around 100 GB for the client side, lo client side logging. Uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the roughly the, the, the scale that we're operating at. Uh, so let's start with Logstash. So what is Logstash? Logstash is a log aggregator. It's a log preprocessing pipeline. Uh, it, con it consists of three input, three stages, input, filter, and output. Uh, I'll go into that. Elasticsearch is your full text searching and indexing engine uh, built on top of Apache Lucene. It's a, it has a RESTful web interface with which you can query. Uh, you can, you can uh, see all your data. Yeah, and uh, it's horizontally scalable. You can add more servers to um, <coughs> to increase the reliability as well as your speed of uh, searching. Uh, Kibana is your front end for visualizations. Uh, it has uh, one of the best features of Kibana is actually the, the geo, geo visualizations. So which we actually uh, use, so let, let's say that uh, you want to view uh, what requests are uh, in real time, where are people watching this current video? Or in, in, uh, in real time, where are the signups coming from and from which particular apps? So you can view that in real time on a, on a, on a, on a geo map. Uh, so for example, <coughs> this is one of our geo maps. This is actually everything. So this is uh, our Amsterdam traffic. This is our San, uh, US West traffic. This is the US East traffic. This is Singapore, uh, Southeast Asia traffic. Uh, so yeah, this is one of the cool features of uh, Kibana. And you can view that at, at per endpoint level, uh, like per, per API request level. So I'll come to uh, Logstash. Uh, so Logstash is uh, basically three-stage pipeline. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's written in uh, J, it's a JRuby project, uh, also owned by Elasticsearch. Uh, the three-stage pipeline is input. It can be any stream. There's a bunch of streams, a bunch of uh, input uh, plugins that it supports. Uh, you can read from a local file. You can read from a queue. You can read from Redis. You can even read from Twitter stream if you just give it your OAuth credentials. Uh, basic stuff if you want just uh, you can send logs to it over TCP or UDP. Uh, filter is basically a mutation. You want to do some pre-processing on your logs. Let's say you want to remove uh, some field. Let's say you want to remove the uh, auth the client token uh, or scrub that token from being stored in your logs. That's, that's where you do that. Uh, you can even run Ruby code. So let's say you have a large string uh, the, uh, and you want uh, you have a URI with all the get parameters, and you want to explode that get parameters into key value pairs, so you can do that here. Uh, 
if you give it your GeoIP data file, uh, either country level or city level, it can convert an IP address field to the actual geolocation field, uh, and then give it give that to Kibana to, to do the, the geo visualizations. Output is uh, it can output to a bunch of sources: Elasticsearch, RedisQ, Five PageDuty. So if you say that if if in your log file there's a line error connecting to database, and you want a PageDuty alert on that, though that's not advisable, you should be doing that with metrics, not with logging. Uh, you can even do that here. Uh, one one thing that I want to talk about is uh, the so I'll slowly get into the performance part of this. So input input is the number of threads allocated for input is the number of inputs that you have. So if you are only using one sort of an input, you'll have one thread for that. Filters is basically a user configurable option. You can set, specify the number of workers that you want for that. That depends on the uh, on the amount of filtering that you're doing. Uh, output. This is the main bottleneck in Logstash, is that the output is single-threaded. Uh, and so if you're writing to Elasticsearch, that's just one thread. Uh, so based on our current, based on our tests with, the, with, the, with various hardware, uh, the best we could do with uh, one Logstash process without burning a hole in the pocket was uh, around 1,000 requests, 1,000 logs per second with one Logstash process uh, being written to Elasticsearch. Uh, there's another piece of the puzzle called the Logstash forwarder. So Logstash Forwarder is a Golang project uh, uh, program that sits next to your log files at the actual server where, where your logs are being generated. It uses this protocol called Numberjack, and it forwards logs files from a uh, lo lo logs from a file to the Logstash server. Uh, earlier, uh, Logst so Logstash doesn't have a good queuing mechanism. So if if any if any of the pipelines is slow, output, uh, filter, or input, Logstash will block. <laughs> So you're basically getting a lot of delay in your logs, or you might even miss logs. Uh, to solve that, earlier people were using a Redis or Q to keep a sort of a buffer for the logs. Uh, Logstash forwarder removes the need for that because it works, uh, uh, because it keeps a marker in the file that, hey, I have read the logs till this time, and I'll be sending those logs at, uh, in the future. Uh, it also works well with log rotate, so it can even uh, uh, send logs from a log rotated file if it has missed those. So that's, that's the good thing about those. Uh, we use Docker in production. Uh, we have around, uh, so let's say one machine has around 10 containers. All the containers, logs, var log folder is volume mounted to the host. Logstash forwarder runs in a container and also it reads the logs from these uh, volume mounted files from all the other containers. So basically, all it's actually uh, I heard here. So application service container one, application service one container two, they're all mounted to the same place on the host. And Logstash forwarder is also running inside a container and uh, it picks up logs from here and sends it to, so I'll come back here. Uh, so to solve the problem of the output thread being a single thread, and we can't get much performance out of it, so we run a pool of Logstash processes. Uh, for, as I'm saying, 300 GB of data, so that roughly translates to around 6,000 to 8,000 requests on average. At peak times, we have even done 25,000 requests, uh, uh, 25,000 uh, logs per second being indexed in Elasticsearch. Uh, so to, to be able to support that, this is what, what we need. So we have a four log stash machines, that's the config. Each machine is running seven processes, five are dedicated for application logs, two are dedicated for client logs. This is just through basic trial and error testing. And, uh, uh, we run an HA proxy in front of all the log stash machines. So these are the log stash machines. Uh, and there's an HA proxy in front of that. Uh, we can, if you want to scale it, we can just add more processes. So. Logstash forwarder container from all the hosts sends it to HA proxy, which sends it to the multiple Logstash, uh, uh, Logstash processes, and then that sends it to the Elasticsearch cluster. Uh, so this is our Elasticsearch hardware. Uh, 12 cores, 64 GB of RAM with RAID 0, uh, 2 into 3 terabytes, 7200 RPM disks. Uh, there are 20 nodes. Uh, so keep in mind that the number of nodes should be greater than the number of shards for your each index should be greater than or equal to the number of nodes. Uh, this is to basically distribute your search requests across the entire fleet of uh, uh, fleet of servers. Uh, so we keep three replicas. So basically, three replicas means that we can afford to lose three machines at a time without losing any data. Uh, each day, it's around 300 GB, so that roughly translates to three months of data that we can store in Elasticsearch uh, on 120 terabytes of this space. Uh, yeah, so this is, uh, I hope what is, this is not what you guys are at. So, yeah. Because it cannot stream this faster. 
Okay, so this is one. Uh, this, these are some tips for uh, hardware tuning your uh, tuning your Elasticsearch cluster. So, so Java uh, has this uh, thing where it compresses your pointers if the heap size is below 30.5 GB. This is a magic number you can read. Uh, so if you Google for Java compressed oops, uh, that will tell you why, what's the reason behind this. Uh, there's a so uh, Elasticsearch uses Lucene and Apache Lucene at the back end. And Apache Lucene has this uh, makes really good use of Linux file, Linux file cache buffers. Uh, so the advisable uh, amount is you specify half of your machine for the JVM heap, and half of the machine for, half of the machine is uh, used by Lucene for file buffers. Uh, so for much much faster searching, you can even you, you can go up to 128 GB RAM, but then it, after that it becomes cost ineffective, and you should not exceed 30.5 GB of heap because then your GC pauses will be too long. Uh, and Java will actually be effectively consuming much more memory if you exceed that exceed that 30.5 GB. Uh, SSDs are great, but pockets are also great. We need to save money. Uh, uh, if if you're using SSDs, then you should set your I/O scheduler to deadline uh, that that optimizes the writes to the to, to the disk. Uh, uh, since we have RAID zero, we, we we have had cases of our disks failing. Uh, if like even if one if one one disk fails of the of the two we are we are out of data, uh, but we actually don't need to worry very much about that. And the machines can easily be replaced uh, because we have multiple copies of data. Just that we cannot exceed three machines failing at the same time. Uh, and also one of the biggest uh, important point to note is the you need to disable swap. Uh, so for Elasticsearch, uh, even though we store 90 days of data on disk, uh, we only keep last 20 days of disk. Uh, Last 20 days of data open in memory, uh, because this data is quite huge. Uh, doing calculations and aggregations on those on that, it's very easy to run out of uh, 640 GB of heap memory. Uh, so we only keep last 20 days of data open. If somebody requests that, hey, I need to look at much much longer data, uh, much uh, older data, then we can open the open that indexes. And for for a certain amount of time, it takes around one or two hours to open the old, older indexes. So that's why uh, if you're indexing logs at that scale without burning a hole in your pocket, you can't use this as your primary monitoring uh, stores. But this is really great for uh, when you want to debug your application, then you really save a lot of time if you are not SSHing into 20 servers at once. Uh, so field data is a cache used while sorting and aggregating data. Uh, you have to keep in mind, so you have to continuously monitor that uh, while you're setting up your cluster to, to see what is the breaking point of a cluster. Once your field data becomes full, there's no, I mean, there's no going back unless you set up a circuit breaker, uh, which basically cancels all the queries that will require more memory than what is currently available. So, uh, in the Elasticsearch config, there's a circuit breaker that you can set up. If you, if by any chance you exceed that as well, uh, and you want to prevent your entire cluster going for a toss, you should clear your cache, and that, and that field data can be rebuilt for the next set of queries. Uh, shards should be greater than equal to the number of nodes for optimal performance. Uh, there's also a uh, uh, Lucene uh, uh, option called Force Merge. Uh, so when you are uh, going through, when you're uh, sending logs uh, to your Elasticsearch cluster, these logs are stored. So each index is uh, one day of logs. So that means that you will not be adding more logs to the older indexes. You will only be adding logs to the, let's say, today's index, or maybe some more logs to the yes to yesterday's index. So it can be safe to apply this operation called force merge on the older uh, indexes to improve performance uh, while you search the older indexes. What this, do, what this does is that each shard is divided into multiple segments, uh, which make indexing faster, but searching slower. Uh, so when you do a force merge, it, 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 you reduce the number of segments. And, that improve, and, and since you're no longer indexing, you don't care about indexing speed. You only care about searching speed. So that makes searching slightly faster. Uh, uh, one of the bugs that you know, the issues that we have been bitten with before is uh, you want to prevent. Uh, so Elasticsearch is a cluster, uh, cluster, right? So it has a master uh, which keeps track of uh, which node has what shards and which node, which what data resides where. Uh, so you want to avoid a split brain situation, which can happen because of a network partition or because of uh, election timeout uh, for uh, for a new master. That you can have two new mas two masters at the same time, guy, uh, running over the same. Uh, uh, the same cluster and then basically causing a split brain and causing you to lose data. 
so you need to set a minimum number of master nodes, eligible nodes, as a configuration option uh, to be able to prevent uh, to be able to prevent that. Uh, so basics uh, set you need to set higher U limit for uh, Elasticsearch processes so that it can open a large number of file descriptors. Uh, we have a daily cron job which deletes data older than 90 days, closes indices that are older than 20 days, and optimizes, which is basically a force merge operation on Lucene uh, on indices older than two days. Uh, so <laughs> you don't want your data store to become a pain in the ass. <laughs> uh, so it's important to kind of also monitor it. Uh, Elasticsearch has a bunch of uh, tools that you can, with which you can monitor it. Uh, one of the important ones is uh, Marvel, which is an official plugin from Elasticsearch. Uh, it's 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 free of cost, and they constantly ping you to register, but it's okay. You can just ignore that reminder. Uh, this is a snapshot from the from our infrastructure. You can see the number of nodes is 18 right now because uh, two of the nodes were allocated for uh, for another cluster, another small cluster for uh, a specific job. Uh, yeah, so we keep. Uh, this number usually reaches so around 10 billion documents is uh, usually around 20 days of data. Uh, that's the indexing request rate, which is 4K right now at that, that, that time. Uh, yep, that's uh, all for what, what I want to talk about Elasticsearch. Uh, you can catch me in the open space sessions and ask me any questions about this.